So my name is Ori Solis, and I had the, the privilege of um, thinking and writing about the exhibition that was organized by Janet Hype and Bill Sisman, she from New York and she from Amsterdam, that uh, opened about a month ago in Amsterdam in two different venues. Um, it was inspired by the idea of Spinoza, and the exhibition was, in fact, called Ex uh, Spinoza Marano of Reason. Spinoza, as you probably know, uh, came, his family, that is, came from Portugal. They had been Jews there who, at some point along the line in the 15th or early 16th, well, it would have been the 15th century, were under pressure to and forced to and converted to Catholicism from Judaism. And as you probably also remember, because I know you all went to high school, um, the Jews were expelled first from Spain in 1492 and then from Portugal uh, a few years later in 1496-7. So if you stayed behind, what that meant is that you were ostensibly a Christian. The problem is that over the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, there were many former Jews who converted to Christianity who continued or were perceived to continue to secretly be living lives as Jews. So I go to church on Sunday, I go to Mass on Sunday, but I'm lighting Shabbat candles Friday night. And I'm celebrating Easter, but I'm actually eating nothing but unleavened bread on Passover. Those acts, from the perspective of the church, constitute um, heresy. Because as a Jew, it's okay for me to celebrate Shabbat or Yom Kippur or Passover. But if I've been baptized, to continue to do that constitutes heresy. And heresy was a problem that plagued the church since the fourth century. And by the 13th century, you will be tested on these dates, by the way, which is why I'm not using precise dates to make it easier for Richard. Um, that from the 4th century onward, heresy is an problem for the church, one of the many traumas that accompany these triumphs. And the 13th century, the Franciscan and Dominican monastic orders were created in large part to deal with the problem of heresy. They would establish boards of inquiry first in southern France, then through Italy down to Sicily. There they picked up an interesting methodology, I think in English we call it torture, um, which carried into Spain and played out rather egregiously in the course of the 15th century and following to inquire into the faith of professing Christians. We know the word as inquisition, of course. So Spinoza's family left Portugal probably around 1580, which would have been in the context of the Reformation, Counter-Reformation era of wars, the time period in which Holland, the northern provinces of the Netherlands, gained their independence as a Protestant country from Catholic Spain and by extension Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula. And coming into Protestant Amsterdam, his family was able now to open up as Jews in a uh, untrammeled sort of manner. When Spinoza was a kid, he was born in 1632. At the age of seven or eight, he would have seen a fellow by the name of Uri Lacosta, who similarly came from a Portuguese, Marano, turned Jewish background, not only excommunicated by the rabbinic Sephardic authorities of Amsterdam, but in the end committed suicide because the pressure on him, because of how, what he was forced to, to do in order to come back into the community was so strong he committed suicide. I doubt that Spinoza at the age of seven or eight would ever have imagined that he would one day face that same board of Sephardic rabbinic inquiry. In other words, there's an irony here. The Sephardic rabbinate of Amsterdam was afflicted by inquisition, in inquisition disease, so to say. They had picked up the methodology and picked up the kind of concerns and the kind of oppressive mode of thinking from the church from which they had all in the previous couple of generations escaped and they applied it to their own community. They were worried if, God forbid, the Netherlands fell back <coughs> under Spanish and Portuguese control, or even if not, if anyone amongst their community appeared not to be sufficiently religious, that that could be bad for the community overall. And that's what their concern was with Acosta. That's what eventuated as their concern with Spinoza his teachers, Mortera and Manasseh ben Israel, were the very ones who, expecting him to grow up and become a rabbi, would ultimately be bringing him before a board, a kind of Beit Din. And 
the irony within the irony is that Spinoza at the time that he faced this Beit Din in the 1650s, 1655, 1656, had yet to write anything. So whatever it is that they imagined he thought or said that was heretical, they can only have known by hearsay. They can only have known by gossip because he had not yet written anything. And he was initially given the short excommunication, the Nidui, it only lasts for a month. And apparently when he faced the Board of the Inquisition of rabbinic authorities, the Beit Din, he actually refused to respond to any of the accusations that were brought against him primarily by his half-sister and her husband, his brother-in-law. I'll come back to that in a second. When he ignored the outcome, a month later, they pronounced against him the harem, which is a full, you are out of the community, no one may have anything to do with you ever, 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 ever. So aside from the fact that he had not yet written anything that could be construed as anything, much less heretical, we understand that what prompted his half-sister and brother-in-law to proffer charges against him was that they had had an argument, he and his half-sister, about an inheritance from their father, Michael, after his father's death, and Spinoza had gone to the Dutch authorities to have the issue adjudicated. He won the case. He turned around and said, here, you can have it all. I'm not interested. It was just the principle, the point. I want my father's will to be fulfilled. I don't want the money. It's yours. But it appears, and we don't know this for a fact, it appears that the rabbinic authorities were so distressed at the fact that he went to the outside world, that he was exposing their dirty laundry from their perspective in public and the influence on the community should the Christian larger community be aware of what's going on within the Jewish community. But that's why they brought him before the Beit Din. And he shrugged his shoulders, as I said. And the second time he walked away, he didn't even show up at the second Beit Din that gave him his cheret. So one might ask, by the way, so was there anything about Spinoza that would be construed as heretical? Let's assume he was a big mouth, which I don't, because I don't think he was a big mouth. The sorts of things that he later on writes include thoughts that could be construed as disturbing. Heretical, I wouldn't say, but disturbing. Two things in particular. He wrote a lot about the relationship between faith and reason. And he asserted that there's no reasonable proof, even, that Moses brought the tablets down from the law, much less the entirety of the Torah. That's faith, that's belief. One can imagine that that would be a little bit disturbing to the rabbinic leadership. More than that, he recast the way we refer to God, not as God, but as natura naturans, nature naturing. The world is what God has created, natura naturata, nature natured. So the relationship between God and the world is both separate and consonant. Nothing offensive about that except where's that word Deus? Where's that word God? And his point in not using it is the word God kind of personalized it. And therefore I start to think my God versus your God. No one thinks that way about Natura. So these are thoughts that could be and could have been disturbing but are not necessarily inherently disturbing, much less heretical. And Manasseh and Israel, by the way, at the moment was off in England convincing Oliver Cromwell to rescind the decree of expulsion so the Jews could officially come back to England. Or perhaps the outcome would have been different. He was a much more tolerant figure than Rabbi Mortera was. Spinoza goes off and he writes, he grinds lenses, and ultimately he's surrounded by the friends he's got, mostly free-thinking Christians, some Jews actually, who ignored the harem as well, and ultimately he dies, probably silicosis from all that, that glass dust. What he leaves behind proves to be a legacy, not only of revolutionary thinking within Jewish thought, but within Western thought. His commentary on Descartes, the way <coughs> Leibniz in turn comments on Spinoza, makes him an important character within the world of modern Western philosophy that is taking shape in the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. So the organization of this exhibition by Janet and Bilha was designed to offer an array of artists an opportunity to reflect on the array of ways in which one can think about Spinoza and his contribution to the world. And my strategy is very simple. I'm going to offer you 
a half dozen examples from artists who are not present on this panel to be followed by a panel of a half dozen artists. That gives us a dozen, like the tribes, you know. <laughs> all thought out, all thought out. Um, each of whom will talk about his or her work at the exhibition in very quick time. So for example, this is a work by Trix Rosen, which was called Thorny Question. And it puns on the name Spinoza, which means spine or thorn. And Spinoza poses thorny questions for a narrow-minded believer. And you'll notice that he's, she rather, sorry, has created a kind of anthropomorph, but you'll also notice that the hands are cut off as if, like Spinoza, who was cut off from the community, there is thorniness, there is at the same time the rose petals which ultimately beautify and sweeten our world, which is what his thought ultimately does, and he himself gets cut off from the community. Rena Bannett's work is called Tikkun Korim. She's punning on several different levels. Korim means readers, right? And Tikkun Korim refers to the text that is used both when you're studying to read from the Torah. So if you look carefully, you'll see on the left side there are no vowels or punctuation. On the right side, there are vowels and punctuation. And in fact, when you are chanting from the Torah, there's typically someone near you who has that, that tikkun, it's called, in front of him, so as to make sure if you make a mistake to correct you, because you don't want to mess with God's word. So if you make a mistake, you need to correct it. But one looks carefully at the hand. It's the hand of a woman. And it's a woman who is wrapped around with tefillin, that's already revolutionary relative certainly to the time of Spinoza and relative to, for the most part, to the contemporary Orthodox Jewish community. But the tikkun, which is repair, is what the word means in general. We talked yesterday briefly, or we, in the course of events, about tikkun olam, the repairing of the world. So the repairing of your reading is literally the meaning of this kind of a dual text. And if one looks very, very carefully, one realizes we're looking at Deuteronomy 6, which gives us the Shema, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, and so on. But if you look very carefully, you'll notice that the vowels that are under the microscope have changed so that all of the male Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, and it goes on from there, Baruch Shem Kavod, Everything that is masculine has been feminized. And you don't have to change a single consonant in order to make that adjustment. You're just changing the vowels, which of course in the text of the Torah itself don't exist. Which raises a question about the genderization of a God that is understood in Judaism to be without gender. And obviously it is a revolutionary, one might say heretical, to change the text as it has been traditionally read, at least as far back as the Masoretes, at least at 13 centuries, is by definition revolutionary, and so she's intending to kind of follow up on Spinoza's revolution. It's not just that Spinoza wasn't the first one to question in Amsterdam, because Uriel Acosta is a key figure before him who also does so, but there have been problematic characters, of course, throughout Jewish history, because one of the things about the Jewish tradition is that it offers no papacy, it offers no doctrinaire, this is how you've got to do it. There's always within the rabbinic tradition dialogue and trialogue and quadrilogue about what something means. One of the more famous characters of the second century was Elisha ben uh, Abuya, who in fact is said to have apostatized. And Richard McBee's Elisha triptych, uh, well, it does a lot of things. I'm just going to point out um, three elements of it and leave it at that for now. One is that it is a triptych, which is, of course, a standard Christian mode of uh, creating art for the last 15 centuries because in Christian terms it symbolizes the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So any Jewish artist, it seems to me, that uses a triptych form in the modern era, at least in part, is reflecting on the question of where do I as a Jewish artist fit into Western art which has a strong Christian component to it. Secondly, in case that's not enough, he is of course taken um, a, a Greco painting of um, Help Me Out from Tour, St. Martin of Tours. And that's what he had, that's the basis of that central image. And thirdly, the character with whom he stands who did not apostatize, it's Shabbat, he's riding on a horse as a symbol of his apostasy. 
and they get to a point, which is the end of the Eruv, and he turns to his colleague and says, you gotta go back. And his colleague says, but can't you also come back? And the question of whether one can and one can't. The question of the dangers, because Alicia Ben Abuya is said to have explored to too great an extent mysticism and things of that sort, which is what caused him to apostatize. The danger of being a painter, the danger of being an artist, the danger of being a Jewish artist within the modern world, and the various ways in which you respond to art and to the world um, are symbolized, in a sense, by Alicia. On the other hand, Joel Silverstein, who also offers us a um, reflection on the place of Jews within the larger world, Jewish art within the larger world of art, gives us in his painting called Spinoza the Modernist, a dichotomized figure where to our right, this is the standard ops familiar portrait that he has played with of Spinoza. But on the other side, he's given us, you may recognize it, uh, a famous Chagall painting of the, the um, sniffer of snuff from 1912. So a modernist painter, a modernist painting, with a modernist painting of the guy who is one of the initiators of modernism. And yes, in case you didn't get the rest of it, we've got Picasso thrown in with that skull and so on in the lower left, which of course has a long tradition having to do with mortality and immortality within the Christian canon and has, of course, been transformed in a number of ways. And I love the way lower left the skull, upper right the six-pointed star of David. The play on works of art is one which was richly represented in this exhibition that goes in so many different directions. This is the work by Toby Turkle called On the Space Continuum. And some of you may recognize the officer and laughing girl that Spinoza's contemporary Fermer painted in the mid-1660s except that the officer has become Spinoza and the laughing girl has become Einstein. As Toby said, I finally found someone smart enough to sit down and have a conversation with him. <laughs> and the map of the world on the back wall of Vermeer's painting has become the map of the universe, as it were, in Turkel's painting. So she too is playing on these ideas and issues of how to visualize and revisualize, revisioning art and modernity and all its other components. One last artist is Robert Brandwine, whose work, painting again, reflects, as you can see from the material that makes it up, on the migration of his own family from Poland to South America. He's playing on how one transitions from old ways to new ways. Spinoza's family from Portugal to Holland, Western thought from pre-Spinoza to post-Spinoza, his own family, so it becomes very personal, from Poland to South America to, what do you know, he's sitting right here in our audience, a further transformation. He's starting again. I mean, anyone who comes to New York has to start again, as you know. So there are six artists here, each of whom will speak about his or her art, and I want to begin by introducing Judith Joseph, who is a Chicago-based painter, printmaker, and calligrapher. She is also managing director of the Jewish Artist Collective in Chicago, a group of 12 artists who exhibit together, and she teaches an artist's fake midrash. She exhibits widely in solo and group shows and has a thriving practice as a Kedub artist, and I invite you to the pulpit to hold forth. And let's see if I did this right for you. Okay, yeah, well, let me just go. go ahead. <coughs> If we're looking for the culprit behind Spinoza's radicalism, it's not this or that philosopher, it's the city of Amsterdam itself, where you could run into dissident reform thinkers, Catholics, Jews, atheists, Lutherans, political radicals, religious radicals. 
it was a real interesting and heady mix. I'd like to share how I find inspiration as an artist from not only from Spinoza, but also from the environment of Amsterdam, which shaped him. This is a painting by Jacob von Roysdael, um, just a generation later than Spinoza. And what's notable about the Dutch landscape artists is that they dropped the horizon. They lived in a place where the land was reclaimed by, from the sea, so it was perfectly flat and the sky is so big there. So they featured the sky more than other um, previous landscape artists in Europe. It's a typical Dutch sky. It's rolling with fat clouds off the sea, but it has intense, intense patches of blue. I took this photo right outside the Rijksmuseum, which is where you go to see the Vermeers and the Rembrandts and the Von Roysdales. The wind is really brisk there. It can practically knock you over but you feel that the world is so open, the possibilities are endless and you could fly away in that sky. This is a model ship that I saw at the Rijksmuseum and I was entranced by it. It was in, it's in the city that launched great exploration and trade. I love to sail and I love to draw old ships. For me, they represent adventure and freedom. So the ship became an element in my work about Spinoza. When the Jewish Art Salon posted a call for art about Spinoza almost a year ago, I knew immediately that I wanted to make new work around this theme. I began with the famous portrait, and I was struck by the elegance of his face. His eyebrows are like the wings of a raven. So I started sketching with my pencil, um, and I pictured Spinoza as an oversized presence. This was my rendition of the harem, the excommunication. And the Jewish community is represented at the bottom behind a dark wall, which so they are in the dark. There's a wall that they created that separates them from Spinoza. And I included the endless horizon of the sea dotted with sailing ships off to explore the East Indies and the West. And sailing ships floating upward like Spinoza's thoughts, unbound by gravity or convention. Then I later revised the drawing to make Spinoza himself into a ship catching wind and soaring with the freedom of his mind. I usually work in series, so I decided to make three woodblock prints about Spinoza. This was the first one. They're all 20 inches by 16 inches. Here I thought of Spinoza the lens grinder, peering closely at the world, his collar become wings. Below him are the windmills and rooftops of Amsterdam and the canals. This work and the next one were included in the Spinoza ex exhibit in Amsterdam. Antony van Leeuwenhoek uh, was a Dutch lens grinder and he was born just one month before Spinoza. They moved in the same circles and I think it's, it's clear they must have known each other. It's like, very likely. Van Leeuwenhoek is hugely important. He discovered the micro. In the most Dutch of ways, combining the Dutch skill for lens grinding with the ubiquity of water, he peered at a drop of canal water through his expertly ground lens and was the first human being to see the microscopic world. Like the discoveries of Galileo, who was still living when Spinoza was a child and was also persecuted by religious authorities, this opened the world to scientific inquiry and showed that religious authorities did not have all the answers. Science, along with the philosophies of Descartes and Thomas Hobbes, was knocking on the door and Spinoza answered. So I portrayed Spinoza in the center standing on the head of von Leeuwenhoek, who emerges from the microbe-ridden waters of the Dom. And you can see that I've made Spinoza sort of morph into a tree of life, and he's also wearing a tallit, because he really never disavowed Judaism. Sir Isaac Newton, also a contemporary of Spinoza and von Leeuwenhoek, wrote, if I have seen farther than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. This was the spirit of the age, which gave rise to the Enlightenment. While I was in Amsterdam, I visited the Stedelijk Museum with fellow Spinoza artist and Jewish art salon member, Dorit Jordan Dotan. I took this photo, which seems perfectly symbolic of Spinoza and his community. They were looking through a narrow porthole at their world, seeing only the established canon of their day. Much like we can peer through this window and see the old buildings of Amsterdam. Spinoza was able to take a wider view, embracing new ideas and getting a bigger picture, as we must back up to read the words on the walls here. 
The text is by George Orwell, another genius who was ahead of his time. I'll leave you with my third view of Spinoza. This one didn't make the cut into the exhibit, but I was happy to have two. Uh, this is my final woodcut print of the harem excommunication. You probably remember it from the sketch. You can see the Jewish community in their dark space at the bottom behind the wall of their own making. Spinoza, buoyed by the wind in the big sky over Amsterdam, soars above. There is some wordplay here. His name, Baruch, which I put in the banner, means blessed, which is a counterpoint to the curse of the harem. Also, I also, like Trix Rosen, picked up on the uh, wordplay of De Spinoza, his Portuguese last name, which translates as, as Thorn. Spinoza was a truly creative visionary, for me, a rose among thorns. David Wander is an artist and a storyteller who's been working for over 40 years interpreting and reinterpreting Jewish folk tales, Megillot, and biblical stories. In a visual midrash format, his Haggadah in memory of the Holocaust was shown in a one-man show at Yad Vashem and published and shown in German throughout through Humboldt University in Berlin. He is shown at Mobia Museum, Temple Emanuel Museum, the HUC Museum in New York, and he has drawn the five Megillot, the Book of Yonah, and uh, the five books of David. And he is our next batter. I just want to thank everybody for coming. It's really nice to be uh, that you came here so early. I'm David Wander. Um, I've long been attracted to this painting of Spinoza. Um, as, a, as a young, as a as about 20 year old, I used to live in, in Amsterdam. And I printed uh, lithographs for Dutch artists. And I would frequently go to the Jewish Museum and look at this painting of Spinoza. But I had no idea who he was. So for this show, I had to figure out who Spinoza was and then who Spinoza was for me. Um, I knew he was a famous thinker. I knew he was given an excommunication, but I also knew the painting was hanging in the Jewish Museum. So I made him my own. Actually, um, I spoke with friends when they said, you're gonna talk about Spinoza. I said, yeah, I'll talk about Spinoza on April 1st. So, um, you know, <laughs> happy uh, April Fool's Day. Um, the more I began to think about him, the more I thought that he was a figure traumatized by historical events. I also think that in America we live with incredible freedoms. Um, as Jews, uh, we're pretty much free to do anything and think anything we want. This wasn't the case in Amsterdam, and it wasn't the case throughout Europe for many years. Um, he was a Portuguese Jew. His parents and grandparents were ex um, expelled from their home in the Inquisition, and I wondered how this affected him. I split the painting in half, and half was um, what he called the fictions and superstitions, and the other half <coughs> was um, um, the moving of, of uh, time. So it was uh, portrayed in, in, um, in this, in, uh, in here, like the stages of the moon and the earth turning here. You can see Spinoza looking at the earth <coughs> and focused, focused on the, um, the earth turning. Behind him, behind his shoulder, is the ever-present cross. Um, I was a printmaker, I said, um, and, I, and what I did to do this piece was to print the word harem on a sheet of rice paper, and then I just printed like uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 of them, and I started out putting them all on this piece of wood, so the entire painting is made up of the word harem. Um, you can see it, um, it's actually in order, a little bit in order on the left side, but on the right side, it's just everywhere. And you can see the menorah is made up of the word cheirum. So um, I, I believe, um, from what I'm reading about Spinoza, like I said before, the superstitions, Shabbat lighting candles, the, um, was all something that he thought was man-made. And that actually put the Jewish community um, at risk. Because at that time, um, to say that the Bible was not God-inspired, was not written by God, was actually heretical and actually put the entire community in, in, um, in danger. It was a small community, and they were they all were expelled, so they really had nowhere else to go. So they really, I mean, I began to feel for the Jewish community that actually expelled uh, Spinoza, 
And so I, I saw this as a real threat to the Jewish life in Amsterdam. Like I said, I, um, I lived in Amsterdam, and uh, in the 70s, um, if you told somebody you were Jewish, frequently they would tell you about the war. Frequently they would talk to you, oh, you're Jewish? This is what happened to me. This is what happened to my family. I lived on the Prinzengracht, which is about five or six blocks from Anne Frank's house. But it was clear that all of Amsterdam had Anne Frank's houses all around the city. Mm -hmm. um, so, so knowing this, I thought a lot about who this person was and the trauma of the Jewish people more recently. So, um, yeah. Uh, let's see. 30 seconds, really? Yeah. All right, fine. Um, so, so, right, so what I did here was, um, I'm sorry. You know, I'm really, it takes a while for me to like get not nervous, uh, to be nervous about speaking, so now I'm feeling a little better. But um, now it's 30 seconds. But the, uh, the, the, per the Jewish person in the corner who's getting his pay is cut represents the Inquisition, but a much more contemporary Inquisition. It represents the Holocaust. And if you look closely at the painting, there's blood on the scissors. So it's actually that his beard is forcefully being cut. You can see that person actually is relating to Spinoza himself, who is clean shaven. And you can also see I made the eyes larger, as if they're seen through the lenses that he was grinding, so that actually he's like focused on the earth turning, and that's where he found his God to be. I think the last thing that I wanted to say was um, uh, Spinoza struggles with a, a trauma similar to what I struggle with, wrestling with a God who may not listen to human prayers, who actually doesn't respond, didn't seem to respond in the Holocaust to all the prayers, and actually Spinoza said, okay, but I still believe in God. So now who's the God I believe in? And on this side, it's, it's where he actually, um, he, he finds his God, that he can believe in a God of nature, a God of how the world works, a God of time, and actually never renounced being Jewish, and, and, and embraced actually this God, and I say my Spinoza is a deer in the headlights of history, searching and writing about a God he could believe in. Thank you very much. Our third speaker is Goldie Gross, a Brooklyn-born artist and raised <laughs> curator student. She's curated several exhibitions for the Jewish Art Salon, was the curatorial assistant for this exhibition, and uh, also the co-producer of the Jerusalem Between Heaven and Earth exhibition at the Jerusalem Biennale two years ago in 2017. And uh, you can find her work in galleries and non-traditional art venues all over the place. So, Gold, you are coming, right? Yeah, oh, you are, okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Oops, that's just too much.
the Association of the Spinoza House in Amsterdam, in, sorry, in The Hague and in Rheinsberg. There's two separate houses. Um, so the tiles are taken from Rheinsberg, the windows are taken from Rheinsberg as well. And the sloping green ceiling is from his house in The Hague. And right now it is um, not belonging to the Association of the Spinoza House. A random local person lives there. Um, and they were able to go to his room to take a picture for me. This is the room that he died in. It was reconstructed in the 20th century by the association um, when the house, after the house was discovered in 1923. Um, but they couldn't afford to maintain it, so they sold it to the government in the 70s, and now they only operate out of the ground floor, which I think is a problem because it's just a random person living in the room he died in, and it's a special place, I think. Um, and so now they're trying to remain. speaker is Cynthia Beth Rubin, who is an early adapter of digital imaging, beginning the transition from paint in 1984. Rubin's digital prints, her videos, her interactive works have been shown on the ICC facade in Hong Kong, the Jewish Museum in Prague, Cotton Club Screen, ICA in London, and the Jerusalem Biennale, as well as numerous international festivals, and her awards include multiple Connecticut Artist Fellowships, any foundation on the arts, Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture and more, and artist residencies in France, Israel, Canada, and Scotland. And you come up next. There we go. Uh, I wanted to start with this image of my great-grandmother because one of my ways of trying to get into Spinoza was thinking that the previous generation, our parents' generation, didn't really remember our past. And I think Spinoza was caught in more into our parents' generation way of thinking that they wanted to not relate to their past. And now we're of the generation where like, I found this picture smashed, ruined in my aunt's closet. Um, so this remembering of where we came from is one of the things that was really important to me about how I found my way into Spinoza. For me, getting into Spinoza was a real challenge um, this is the work that we exhibited. I collaborated with Yana, who's here, and we also collaborated with another artist to do a web-based version. So I was thinking, what do artists and philosophers have in common? How can I find my way as an artist into thinking about what philosophers do? And revealing the unseen was what I came up with. This is, I've been working with microscopic work myself, um, looking under the microscope, um, you see this kind of guy, and then there's a the detail of my image, and using augmented reality to simulate what it's like to look under the microscope. And I think Spinoza, as a lens maker, faced many of those same issues of discovering a world that made him look forward and question um, everything about his life. I have been doing a number of ways. <coughs> Okay, this is an older piece that I did with the composer Bob Gluck. It's an interactive work that I can speak over it. Mean, the most um, that explores really the world that Spinoza came from. It's based on a Bible that was produced in Toledo in 1260 and left with the expulsion and wandered all over the world. It was found in the public library in Marseille. Nobody knows where what happened to it for about 300 years. And I feel like that remembering history, this is my piece based on the world that Spinoza came from, of old Spanish world. And this is where Spinoza is today. Yono went out and shot, did some shots of Amsterdam. Um, and here's Amsterdam. And he was living in this present, and my whole thing about how do we get into philosophy has been what's unseen, what's unseen in the microscope, what's unseen in the past. So our series that we began working on was, is based on the Lower East Side of New York, um, specifically the synagogue, the Staten Street Shul. And when Yona first approached me about collaborating, she said, this one's not playing. Hmm. Okay, there we are. Um, she said, there are these zodiacs, and I want to do something about the zodiacs on the Lower East Side. And I'm like, zodiacs? Like, zodiacs? 
in a painted synagogue on the right side. I didn't know they were there. I didn't know Jews had, had zodiacs. I don't care about zodiacs, but Yona has been, had been working on zodiacs. This is actually her painting. Um, the, sorry, I forgot to put your name there, but you're here, so I can say. Um, they had asked to several artists, the Stanton Street Chulas, they were contemplating renovating the zodiacs to do some drawings, some paintings of them as, as another way of interpreting. So that's where she was coming from. I was like, for me, the Lower East Side means my ancestors. It means these are my great aunts. It means living in that environment. And so we began working. This is one one of our pieces. That the piece that we had in the exhibit is actually a compilation of an ongoing series. <coughs> one minute, okay. So, you know, one of the videos, um, we began making more and more complex backgrounds for each of the zodiacs. And then it's an interactive piece. So with augmented reality, these videos come up. Um, and there's a combination of my aunt singing in Yiddish, because that's part of the memory. Um, we have an interactive web version. I've learned to put up pictures of collaborators or people don't believe they exist. Um, you can go to the website and look at this. This is basically what you see online. So for the month, some of them, this one I love because it has the fish from Ostia Antica, it has live fish, it has everything, and then it has this. So being on the Lower East Side and looking back. And so it's an ongoing series. This is how we exhibited it. This is the piece you just saw, um, how it works in augmented reality. You hold it up, and so it actually works both ways. Um, just to show you a couple more of the videos, I love this one of my aunt looking through the contemporary Mahitsa, which wasn't there when my aunt lived on the Lower East Side. My great aunt, my great sister. But the women now. So this is the clash of cultures. And for me, that was the end. Um, I went over my rehearsal with, with uh, Rena, who's not here, but whose work you just saw. And I wanted to include her thoughts because she really informed what I said today. That he saw, because he used lenses, he saw things differently in his world. Uh, and I think a lot of us have brought that up. So here he is. And this is a repeat, I guess. So here we are, just uh, credits. And thank you. Our next presenter is Lenore Mizrahi Cohen, who is uh, a mixed media conceptual artist based here in Brooklyn. She employs Arabic and Hebrew language, calligraphy, imagery, and light to create art that contrasts past and present cultural values. Her family heritage is as a Syrian Jew, and that's a deep well of inspiration for her work, which has been exhibited and collected in the USA and abroad. And is she on the same? Three you on the same? No, next one. Okay. Hi everybody, good morning, and thank you for coming to listen to us speak about our work. It's important for us to connect with people about the things we care about, and that's why they're in our work. Um, so this is me, this is an image of cut paper Arabic calligraphy, it's the word no, let, in Arabic a few times, scripted and then cut out of paper, and it curls in the most beautiful way, it's almost like the artwork makes itself. Um, my Instagram, so. I'm not going to go too heavily into this because I think a lot of us already touched on the fact that Baruch Spinoza was a child of displaced people. I think it's interesting to note that he had two names, one in Portuguese and the one that we all know is Baruch Spinoza in Hebrew. I think many of us in the audience probably also have multiple names. I grew up having three, uh, my Hebrew, my English, and my Arabic name. Um, there are a lot of things as a child of, I don't want to say child of displaced people because I'm fifth generation American already by this point. But I grew up in a community that was very much made up of refugees from the Muslim world. Everyone I knew was either a displaced person or their child, and a lot of the things that were part of this community were just very taken for granted by me, um, like having multiple names. So I'd like to suggest that 
the way that my work connects to Barbara Spinoza is that I mediate a lot in my work about cultural shift and change as a result of immigration, especially when it's forced. And we don't know to the extent, how, to what extent being a child of displaced people affected Spinoza and his thought and philosophy, but I would suggest that it is impossible to, to think that it had no effect. Um, being a family that was displaced forcibly from your original origin country, there's no way that doesn't affect you. It is almost the lens through which you interpret all of your future actions. There's this grappling with the past, what happened to us, what was done to us, how do I now have to re-identify myself, my family, my actions, my attitude toward the culture around me and how I relate to it. It's almost the catalyst for everything that comes after. Um, or we touched on the fact that I'm a Syrian Jew, and this is just a quick metric for, I hope most people in the audience are aware of this, but some people are not, that in uh, post-1948 until now, there were about 850,000 to a million estimated Jews living in Muslim countries who were all forcibly expelled, uh, coming with this as the legacy of arrests, tortures, beatings, killings of Jews from all of these countries, and today they live mostly in Israel, some in South America, a large contingent is in the US, um, a lot of people now had to reinvent themselves from scratch and weren't able to take their belongings with them, had to readapt to a totally new society. And again, there's no way that, this, that even if it's a repressed trauma and they don't talk about it a lot, once you start paying attention, you realize that it really affected all of these people in a very deep way, and especially when you start talking to people about their stories, which is something I do a lot in my work. There's a lot of really deep uh, issues that come out. Um, so now about cultural shift. I think that this is a very two-sided coin. There's a lot of positivity that actually happens with this. Um, you can say that Spinoza, as a result of being a child of immigrants, this probably led to a lot of his new ideas and thinking, and he became what we can consider the father, father of modern philosophical thought. So that's a plus. <laughs> um, but of course, all the negatives that I also mentioned is this, this loss that you have to deal with as a community, as an individual. And so there's positives, there's negatives. What I do in my series, Culture Shock, one of which was included in this uh, Barbara Spinoza show, is I just point out uh, some of the issues that I've seen in my life and in my community and society that I think are a direct result of these migrations. Um, if you see on the screen the one called Irreversible in Arabic, Latin UX, this is the one that was in Spinoza, the Spinoza show and pictured is one of my friend's parents on my friend's wedding day. And on the reverse side of the artwork is her great-grandfather from Syria. He's wearing his fez. Um, what I do in a lot of these artworks, the I think that we're, pictures seem to be about a certain topic and that comes out when I look through them. Old family archives pictures, they seem to be about wealth, <coughs> our attitude towards change, our attitude towards heroes and who we worship, who we venerate in our society, and I try to find modern contemporary photographs that will bring about the same issues, and I transpose them, and they're often in the same family. For example, this one with Mickey Mouse that's called Hero. Uh, it's a little hard to tell, but in person it's a double-sided artwork. On one side you have a photo of a little boy in Syria. His parents placed him on a pedestal of a stone statue of a really pu uh, important public figure in Syria from folklore. And on the reverse side you have the same uh, action, the same motion happening with parents with their child in America at Disney World. And I surrounded the figures in, in a halo, the word batal in Arabic, which means hero. It's repeated many times. I script these, I cut them out of paper, and I apply them to the works. Um, what I try to do with the works is highlight specific similarities and differences that might be happening culturally as a result of this displacement. I'm not making any specific comment on if they are positive or negative. I think it's my job as an artist just to point things out and let people be aware of these things, because again, it's important um, for me as a member of a community where people are now speaking a new language, they have changing attitudes, they have their behaviors and perceptions have all shifted and not as by choice. So I think it's important to take stock of these. I think this is a universal Jewish issue that unfortunately Jewish people know too much about, starting over, uh, reorienting themselves, and it's important as we move forward in history and time and culture and place, and as we change and morph to, if we're not going to hold on to everything that came before, at least be aware of what we're discarding and what we're adapting and how that can benefit or hurt us in our new lives and what we give to our future descendants. So um, this is what drives most of my work. If you'd like to engage with me on any of these issues, please do find me on Instagram. I'm having a solo show in May.
where I'm going to really show a lot of these, and thank you to the curators for giving a chance to speak for us. Our last speaker is Yona Ferver, uh, who is Dutch-born and New York-based multimedia artist whose works explore personal and collective identity, history, Kabbalah. Ferver's work has been shown internationally in Jerusalem Biennale, Amsterdam's Troubled Waters, the Andrew Warhol Factory, and the Holocaust Memorial Center. She's been published in four languages, including in the New York Times, New Yorker, and Art Criticism. Favre is the co-founder and director of the Jewish Arts Salon, a temporary Jewish visual arts organization which sponsored the exhibition at the Jerusalem Biennale two years ago and four years ago, and also had something to do, I think, with that thing about Spinoza in Amsterdam or something like that. And I will... Thank you, Ori. I love how you pronounce my last name as Vermeer, because it almost sounds like Vermeer. <laughs> I pronounce it Vermeer, but I like yours better. Okay, when I was studying for my master's degree in fine arts at the Royal Academy in The Hague, I used to bicycle ride every day from home to the academy, and I would ride by uh, the Spinoza house. And I was vaguely aware that it was someone called Spinoza and that he couldn't live in Amsterdam anymore and that's why he was living in The Hague, but I knew just about nothing else about him. I did know that he lived in exile and it was the only thing that I could connect to because I was living in The Hague where I grew up and I didn't want to live in The Hague, I wanted to live in Amsterdam, um, but I was accepted to the art school in The Hague, so um, there you go. Um, that house, which is a photo of here, is where he was, um, it was actually built by another artist, Jan van Gooy, who was like a very famous uh, landscape artist. This is him. And Spinoza lived in that house until he died. And it wasn't until um, artist Bilhan Zussman talked talk to me at the Jerusalem Biennale that's already curated two years ago, uh, not the whole Biennale, but our exhibition, <laughs> Um, she showed me her Spinoza work and talked about Spinoza and I realized he was a fascinating person and fascinating concept. So this is my interpretation of Spinoza. Uh, it's called Code. Um, I've been interested in breaking out of the two-dimensional canvas for many years. Uh, with Cynthia Beth Rubin, I've collaborated in series that she just showed you, uh, where videos are embedded into art. Here's an earlier work of us uh, at the Biennale. You see, oh, actually this is not at the Biennale, but it's an earlier work. Uh, but you see someone using the iPad to access the hidden videos. Um, I've also worked with another artist, Katarzy Ekozera, and right now we have a show in Amsterdam, uh, which is a multimedia installation um, about where I compare anti-Semitism and sex trafficking in Amsterdam. But long before all this tech stuff um, that Cynthia introduced me to, I made sculpted canvases. So this is um, an example from the mid-90s. I call it inquiry. Uh, it was a self-portrait. It was a metaphor for peeling off layers and constrictions. So I made this armature of metal and I layered it with canvas pieces that, you know, to create these openings and then I painted that. So for Spinoza, I returned to that kind of technique. Um, Ori wrote about it as if he's such a you know, much better writer than I am. I'm just going to quote one sentence of him. Yeah. Breaking through the painting's normative flat surface offers a metaphor for Spinoza's intellectual break from normative thinking. So here is the engraving of Spinoza that I based his portrait on. In my case, I made his face split split apart because he symbolized uh, that his life was torn up. He had to split from his family, he had to sue his sister for inheritance, he split from his Jewish community, uh, as was earlier described by other speakers. He was also forced to leave Amsterdam for The Hague. And there are faint echoes of that in my life, um, and that's why I'm drawn to that aspect of him. But in my case, I kind of went in the opposite direction. I grew up in The Hague and wanted to leave. Um, and I ended up not in Amsterdam, but New Amsterdam. Um, I grew up in a different religion, but ultimately embraced and converted to Judaism. I didn't walk away from it. 
So my painting kind of undulates, it has all these curves, and it shows the rocky road he traveled. Um, the significance of the yellow in the portrait, um, yellow has a history in Judaism. Um, often Jews were ordered to wear badges in public during certain periods by ruling Christians and Muslims. Here you see a photo of a uh, couple from Worms, Germany, wearing the obligatory yellow badges. And of course, you're all familiar with the yellow star from Nazi Germany. Um, in the center of the painting, at its most <laughs> recessed point, I wrote the word coat. And it refers to a signet ring, which you see here. It had that inscription on it. The ring had a relief on the design so that you could you know, put it in wax and seal a letter with it. Um, caught means cautiously in Latin, and it's underneath a rose, and a rose itself is also a symbol for secrecy. And you see also his um, initials on the ring as well, the B and the S. Uh, by the way, the term sub rosa means under the rose, and it comes from ancient times. Romans would hang roses on ceilings on banquet halls, and it was understood that anything said under the influence of wine had to be kept a secret. Now, Spinoza had to be secretive because his writings received so much opposition. And it's a secretive world, and also you know, living in various worlds at the time, that uh, appealed to me. Yes, I'm ready to stop. Um, so this is the uh, painting, the installation view. The work on the left is by somebody else. And I want to thank the curator, Janet Hyde, who did a fantastic job, yeah. along with Goldie Gross and Wilco Zussman. And thank you to Orio who wrote a terrific essay about the exhibit. Thank you all.